the mission ending in failure didn't really bother Shepard if she was being honest. Yes, Okia might have had more information about the collectors than what was stored in his terminal, but anyone who was willing to throw away lives in pursuit of some goal just because it gets faster results wasn't someone she could see herself working closely with. She was fully aware that occasionally lives needed to be spent, and it seemed like the flashbacks to Vermeera weren't though with her just yet but that it was the leaders in charge's duty to make sure that they never were spent frivolously. Which was why she was now nursing a minor headache after arguing with her exo that no, she would not be getting rid of the Krogan they had retrieved from the lab. Miranda was right that the Krogan could be a danger, but Shepard had worked alongside Rex plenty of times just fine, and he was one of the most dangerous Krogan alive. Plus it wasn't like she was just going to let anyone just open the thing with no preparation. She sighed and rubbed her forehead in exasperation. The Cerberus officer might not be as bad as Shepard initially thought, but she still was far too uptight sometimes. Ah, Commander Shepard. Shepard looked up to see Kelly Chambers, Cerberus Yeoman and almost certainly spy or informant walking towards her. It was nothing personal against the other redhead, but Shepard knew for a fact that Chambers acted as the unofficial counselor for the ship and any logs from those sessions would eventually make their way back to Cerberus. What made it worse was that Chambers was so damn earnest that Shepard couldn't hold it against her. Though it did ensure she would never sit in on one of the yeoman's sessions. Can I help you, yeoman? I just received word from the purgatory. They've confirmed they are ready to release Jack into our custody and are waiting for us to stop by. Chambers said, falling in step with Shepard as they made their way towards the mess hall. Great news, I'll have Joker set a course after the shift change. Shepard replied. So now that the business stuff is out of the way, how have you been? Kelly asked. I heard a bit from the rumor mill that we have a super Krogan in the cargo bay after your last mission. And that was why it was hard to dislike Kelly. She sounded like she genuinely wanted to know. Not as some kind of agenda, but simply a curious woman. How she wound up in Cerberus was still something Shepard was trying to figure out. Shepard nodded. We do. Okir didn't make it, but if we can figure out if his work is friendly or not then we could use the muscle. It would be interesting to work with a Krogan. Kelly mused. Their people haven't had the easiest time in the galaxy. Sure they are incredible warriors, but there must have been so much more to their culture. Poets, scientists, philosophers, I wonder what they could have given the galaxy if the genophage was never a thing. Shepard thought back to her conversations with Rex. He hadn't ever been one for talking about his people. Most of what she did get him to talk about had to be dragged out, and it didn't paint the Krogan as a species for philosophizing. Hell, Rex himself had practically written them off because even with the dwindling numbers and issues due to the genophage, Krogans kept leaving their home system looking for fights. Well if this one turns out to be friendly I'm sure he could tell you more about Krogan culture. Oak here seemed to be thorough about wanting a true Krogan. Shepard temporized. That would be great. Now if only I could get Revan to share more about her past. A whole other galaxy. She must have so much we could learn. I wonder if she has any music or stories she could share. The revived spectre watched in bemusement as the other woman practically bounced in excitement about what the Sith Lord could share. Still, she was curious herself. You've been talking to Revan? Kelly rubbed the back of her head sheepishly. I've been trying to, but it hasn't been going as well as I'd like. She's hard to talk to. Shepard blinked. While Revan was incredibly hard to get a straight answer out of, she never seemed reluctant to at least entertain a conversation. She knew Miranda was occasionally stopping in and asking questions and hadn't been turned away yet so she couldn't see a reason the personable yeoman would be having issues. Is she? I hadn't noticed that much. Well, maybe, it's more a personal problem. Kelly said, fidgeting in place. Personal problem? Shepard's brow furrowed in thought. Kelly hadn't seemed uncomfortable with any of the other races that were aboard the Normandy. Was she really uncomfortable with a race that looked almost identical to humans? It's just, 
Well, I've kinda had a, thing, for elves since I was a teenager. I might have come off a little strong when I introduced myself and now it's kinda, embarrassing to talk to her. Now Shepard was forced to stop and stare at the yeoman in disbelief. The Cerberus operative who had willingly joined what could best be described as a potential suicide mission to stop a race of aliens from destroying entire colonies was too embarrassed to talk to a crewmate, because of a crush. She almost couldn't believe it. I see. The spectre drew out, completely unsure what to say to that. Well I have a meeting in a bit and am kinda short on time, so, ah, I should go. Not the most dignified way to flee a conversation. But she was not going to be delving into her yeoman's kinks at the moment. Besides she actually did have a meeting to get to. Unfortunately it was with Revan, Shepard sighed. She really didn't need those kinds of images going into this. Oh. After rushing through a quick meal and making her way to the cargo deck, Shepard found herself standing outside the section of the ship Revan had claimed for herself. Unfortunately for the commander, this time she would be here for purely personal reasons and the usual confidence she had dealing with people seemed to have deserted her. After a moment to pull her thoughts together, Shepard cycled herself through the hatch and entered the cargo bay. It hadn't changed too drastically since the last time she had come through here, there were still a ton of crates they had recovered that hadn't been sorted through, but Revan was steadily making her way through all of them and had obviously started sorting out some of the contents based on the small collection of tablets that had piled up on the desk she used. Speaking of the Sith, Revan herself was lounging in a chair, resting her head on one hand and looking at a datapad in the other. With her guard seemingly down, Revan looked simply like a pretty young woman idly reading and not the nearly untouchable force of nature she was on the battlefield. The sight of the elven woman so relaxed unconsciously reminded Shepard of the conversation between her and Kelly. A memory she ruthlessly crushed since she also remembered she was in the same room as a mind reader and had no desire to try explaining that conversation to the subject's face. You should relax a bit. This will be easier without starting off all keyed up. Revan's mild tone broke through Shepard's thoughts and she had to fight to keep a blush off her face. Right empath. So how does this meditation thing work? She asked, brushing past the awkward feelings. I mean I've done therapy stuff before everyone in the alliance does at some point but I can't say I've ever tried meditation before. What I have in mind isn't really therapy. It can be part of it, but this is more self-reflection and understanding how you affect the universe around you. Revan explained. All considered, it's fairly basic. Or so not going to teach me how to be a Jedi? Shepard teased. Absolutely not. Revan hissed, causing Shepard to raise her hands. Whoa, calm down. I was just kidding. She defended herself quickly. Guess I shouldn't joke about that with a Sith Lord. Then paused because saying that out loud still sounded ridiculous to her. Revan let out a long sigh and set aside her datapad. No. I should apologize. The Jedi are theoretically a good role model for this training, but as you might have noticed I'm not a great fan of them. She said with a small smirk before growing serious again. Besides, their teachings work best when you are already in a healthy place. As you are now I'd probably do more damage if I tried to help you that way. Why is that? There is a lot of history here that I don't have time to go into detail if we want to actually get around to dealing with your issue so this might be pretty vague. Revan warned. But Jedi fall into a weird mental space where everything in the universe is part of the Force, yet they deliberately separate parts of themselves and act like it doesn't concern them. For example, they will constantly spout that losing control of your emotions is a terrible thing. That you should suppress and modulate them so you can always act logically and in accordance with their code. She raised a hand to cut Shepard off, not that that's a bad thing. People do need to not let their emotions control them, but the Jedi are content to either push them in a box or cut them off, never actually dealing with the root of the problem. Shepard noticed that as Revan began lecturing, she seemed to relax even more. It seemed the elven woman liked teaching. So the Sith are better off? 
The spectre asked. Revan snorted. Not even close. Where the Jedi tend to cut off their emotions, the Sith like to wallow in them. Someone insults you. Hold on to that anger and use it to crush them. You afraid of something? Focus that fear until you can overcome it. Something challenging you? Beat it into submission because you are more powerful and your pride demands nothing less. Once again not super helpful in developing a healthy mindset. That is not to say that all members of each group are like that. Revan admitted with a shrug. But not really the methods I want to teach. Especially after. She suddenly stopped talking and Shepard remembered what Revan had said about her apprentice. So no teaching me the secrets of the Force then? Shepard joked to hopefully move past that point. Thankfully it did seem to work. PFFT, not even taught the basics and you want me to delve into that stuff. No chance. But we should get started or I'll just keep wasting time. Revan shifted so she was sitting cross-legged and motioned for Shepard to do the same. I doubt we will get too far just the first time so we will start with a calming and focusing exercise. Here is what you need to do. Oh. A couple hours later Shepard walked out feeling, not lighter, but maybe more settled. Her issues hadn't magically gone away and she still had a few uncomfortable questions constantly swirling around her head, but the thought of going out and presenting a strong facade to the rest of the ship and acting like she was fine didn't feel like it was crushing her for a change. Apparently her new attitude was easily noticed because it was the first thing Garrus commented on when she stopped by to visit. Shepard, you seem happy. Good news or something? Ah, not really? I just got done meeting with Revan and she was willing to teach me some stuff from her home. While Garrus was a friend, he didn't exactly need to know how Shepard was dealing with everything. He had his own issues. Losing a teammate was hard. Losing your entire team was crushing. He didn't need to worry about Shepard on top of all that. I don't blame you. If I had the chance to talk to someone out of an old Turian myth I'd jump at it too. Yeah I wait, Turian myth. Shepard furrowed her eyebrows. I'm not surprised if you didn't know. Old stories, ones from before we even got off Palavan. But Dad always did like the classics. Garrus said. Shepard made a mental note that Garrus seemed on better terms with his father. As far as she knew, until now they didn't really get along. I haven't thought of those old Jedi and Sith stories in years. You wouldn't believe how shocked I was to find out some of them are real. I'm guessing you had Edie look it up on the extranet? He continued. No, Shepard drew out slowly. We found the terms in an old human database from years back. The two of them looked at each other silently for a bit. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? Gara said eventually still a little off balance. Shepard pulled up her omni tool and started typing in commands. I think it means that we've had more contact with Revan's galaxy than we've thought. Is that a bad thing? Shepard paused for a second, thinking. I don't know. She said eventually. But for once we might be able to find out something about what Revan might have up her sleeve before she springs it on us. Right. So have Edie go through a bunch of old myths and stories and hope to find a match? Garrus asked. Shepard shook her head. No, as useful as she would be, Cerberus is still tied into her systems. I think I'll leave this to the Alliance. They have a division for this kind of thing. She finished sending a message to Hackett. With any luck we might be able to bargain for something directly and not just whatever she decides to offer. It was a long shot. Even if they did manage to find references to Revan's home there was no guarantee that the Sith would be able to give them the designs for anything, but it would be better than going into negotiations blind. Garrus groaned and gave Shepard a look. You remember when this job made sense? Just hunting down a rogue agent with a bone to pick? Now it's all civilization destroying spaceships and extragalactic aliens. She smiled. Please. Anything less would be way too easy for us. Hair, guess you got that right. Oh. Revan contemplated what she should do with the schematics on the datapad in front of her. 
In theory it was a similar problem she had faced already. The galaxy was not prepared for a sudden invasion a significant scale and she needed to either reinforce the current factions or build up a new one in preparation. The problem was, this time she wasn't in position to be the driving force, there was very little stopping whatever group she worked with from simply stringing her along for as long as they needed to get the full design and then cutting her loose. And unlike back home she didn't have a potential army of honor-bound followers or like-minded peers that accepted her superiority over them. Here everything would be a fight between her and an already established group. Sure, she could probably subvert a few people as needed. But she would require hundreds to even begin a large project. Not to mention the infrastructure to go along with that. A ping came over her omnitool and she opened it to see a call from Shepard. Revan accepted it with the flick of a finger. Commander, can I help you with something? As far as she knew there was nothing major coming up that needed her attention but things may have changed. We're just about to dock with the purgatory. If you want to come with, better get ready now. Revan thought about it, and ultimately decided it wasn't worth it. She didn't have much interest in the prison ship and she was busy with her own thing at the moment. I appreciate the warning but I'll stay on the Normandy. You shouldn't need my help retrieving an already captive prisoner. Right, well this shouldn't take long. Just to let you know I'm taking Miranda and Jacob with me, but Mordin wanted a word with you when you have a chance. Noted. Revan replied and ended the call. While she did want to keep planning her next move, taking a moment to talk to the Salarian shouldn't take too long. Perhaps she could probe him about smaller factions that wouldn't take too much effort to gain control of. Oh. Ah Revan, glad you could make it. Had some concerns about your species' reaction to potential vaccine for collector drones. Need a fresh genetic sample to ensure no adverse reaction. Mordin greeted the Sith as she walked into the science bay. Hello to you too, Mordin. And I thought you had enough from last time? Revan replied not exactly thrilled to go through another round of needles for the Solarian scientists' experiments. Morden briefly nodded. Yes, initial samples were fine for the first rounds of testing. Blood compatibility, hormone interference, cell mutation rate. All excellent starting points for vaccine prototype. However, samples degraded after vigorous destructive testing. Using those for the final version could lead to, he inhaled deeply unfortunate side effects. Revan's lip quirked in a mix of amusement and nervousness. Still, biology wasn't her strong suit. So if the scientist said he needed more samples so his vaccine didn't fry her nervous system or something, she would be happy to provide. After Mordin had collected the necessary samples, Revan waited until the Solarian had stored everything and was undistracted, idly rubbing at the sore sites where he had done the tissue extractions. She was unsure if he knew about her force healing ability, but had determined to not bring it up until she was nowhere near a lab for fear of the eager scientist latching on to studying the phenomenon. She would heal herself later and then volunteer the next person to be injured as a test subject instead if needed. Once he stopped moving around the lab, she decided to see if the doctor knew anything she didn't. So, Professor, I heard that you used to be part of some sort of covert intelligence group. Yes, Solarian Special Tasks Group. Respected organization. Clandestine. Handles difficult assignments with limited oversight. Morden explained as he started fiddling with a computer screen. Recon, analysis, occasional wet work. Identify problems, have neutralization options ready should need arise. Model for Council Spectres based on Special Task Group. Very similar. Revan made a note to keep an eye out for potential STG interference in her future plans. Groups like that tended to be on the lookout for rising powers and like keeping new players under control, especially if they weren't already tied to an existing power in some way. Is that so? Unfortunately, besides the fact that the commander is a spectre I don't know much about the group. How similar are they? Salarians lack numbers, brute strength, military prowess. Have to rely on stealth, intelligence. Agents trusted, 
given wide operative freedom. Spectres similar. Given goal, told to accomplish. Better funded of course. Didn't have to buy our own weapons. The professor joked. Ah, so the spectres and STG are similar to Jedi shadows then. Revan realized. That was good news for her short-term goals. She hadn't had the time to go through each council race's military structure in detail just yet, but had come across dozens of references to the two groups. Finding out they were individual agents rather than a standing army meant that she wouldn't need to worry about just being attacked in force if someone decided to take offense, but it did mean bad things about long-term combat strength. If two of the major armed factions were based on precision strikes, how useful would they be against capital ship-sized attackers? Probably not very. Which could complicate things later, but Revan would worry about that when she had solved her own issue on that front. Well since you were part of the STG you must have kept tabs on some of the groups out in the galaxy right? Any chance that one of them would be willing to help with our mission? I know Shepard isn't thrilled to be working so close with Cerberus. Mordin opened his mouth to answer but before he could say anything he was cut off by the ship-wide intercom. Joker to scary Sith overlady, we've got a problem. Revan narrowed her eyes at Joker's nickname for her, but shelved her annoyance for now. What is it? The warden double-crossed us. He tried to take the commander prisoner and now we've got a bunch of mercs trying to break into the Normandy. So, ah, uh, how about some help up here? Revan and Mordin exchanged looks before they both started moving. Mordin reached into a drawer and retrieved an SMG while Revan started heading to the front of the ship. Her long strides eating up the distance. I'm on my way. Edie, shipwide alert. Prepare to repel borders. And get ready to open the airlock. I'll take care of the ones outside myself. She ordered, not really caring if she had the authority to at the moment. Very well, Revan. The AO responded as a klaxon started blaring across the ship. Shall I direct anyone to go with you? No need. The Sith replied, flipping her hood up over her helmet. This shouldn't take too long, the purgatory was falling apart around them. Alarms were blaring, prisoners were rioting, the guards seemed to have given up any hope of containing things and were collapsing into an every-man-for-themselves situation. And honestly? It wasn't the most chaotic environment Shepard had been thrown into. She wasn't even sure it cracked the top ten. Shepard, two on the right. Garrus called out from his overwatch position. Got it. Miranda, watch my back. Shepard quickly located the two guards that decided fight was the better option than flight and charged one of them biotically. The rush of energy gave her a faux sense that time slowed down so it seemed to take an eternity for her to jam the barrel of her shotgun into the guard's midsection and pull the trigger. The Turian's armor wasn't enough to save him and his chest burst open in a shower of dark blue blood. His friend didn't fare much better when Shepard's biotically empowered fist drove itself into his face and she felt bone give way. A burst of machine gun fire behind her caused her to spin around expecting to find another guard pointing a gun at her. Instead, she saw him slouching over with bullet marks in a neat little cluster on his chest and Miranda standing nearby looking for more enemies. Good job. Shepard was privately a little wary of the Cerberus operative at the moment. What was supposed to be a simple pickup had turned into this giant mess and she wasn't entirely sure it wasn't because Cerberus decided to change tactics and wanted her out of the picture there was no reason for her suspicion. Miranda hadn't been trying to stab her in the back at any point. The operative had actually been incredibly useful in covering Garrus and herself while they moved through the ship following after the force of destruction they were hoping to recruit. When this was over she would need to schedule another meditation session with Revan. There was no way she was going to let these paranoid feelings drive a wedge between her and her crew with no evidence to back them up. Shepard felt a headache starting to form when she realized that if they successfully recruited Jack then there would be two incredibly powerful people who could tear the Normandy apart with their minds living in pretty close quarters. She could only hope that Revan would be the mature one there and back down if needed, 
since Jack had proved pretty definitively she wouldn't hesitate to wreck the ship she was on. Oh God, they were all going to die before they got anywhere near the collectors weren't they? Oh! Gottis Nazagius wondered for the millionth time how an idiot like Kural managed to find himself running an operation like the Purgatory. Personally, he put it down to connections. Kural was lucky enough to know the right kind of people to get ahead in life, while people like Gottis were forced to claw the scraps from what was left. Gottis was born to normal parents, had a normal education, and hadn't exactly had the chance to stand out during his mandatory service. If he was the same as the rest of the populace he might not care, but he was smarter than that. He saw Asturians with half his intelligence were given special training and assignments based on who they knew or even who their parents knew. He knew when he was passed over for spectre training that it didn't matter that he was better than his peers, only the people that already had a foot through the door could advance in the hierarchy. So he struck out and joined the Blue Suns, and found that it was the exact same crap just less blatant. Who cared that Kural wanted to cash in on a bounty for that human spectre and go through the most convoluted way possible of capturing her? The female might have managed to get a whole bunch of other people's accomplishments under her name by being the first human spectre, but she was still just a single person. Instead of trying to lead Commander Shafard or whatever into a cell and hoping she would walk in herself, Kura should have just ambushed her with two squads in a hallway somewhere. It's what Gates would have done if he was in charge. No three-man squad would be stupid enough to fight those odds. Instead, because Kural was an idiot, the human prisoner Jack was running loose, the human spectre was still free, and Gottis was being ordered to breach and board the ship the humans came in on because Kural wanted it as a toy or something rather than just outfitting it with some bombs on the hull and blowing it to hell. When he ran things then people would finally have to listen to reason. Right, we're going to split into three groups once we are through the door. The sergeant was saying. Group one will secure the flight controls, we don't want them trying to leave before we have control. Group two will secure engineering. Group three, you're on crew suppression. Try not to kill everyone. We need someone to tell us the access codes. Well, at least this sergeant wasn't a total idiot. They still should have cut through the top of the ship, in Gotti's opinion, but it wasn't the worst plan someone not as smart as him could come up with. He would need to stick to the back of the group though. Ship boarding was dangerous since you never knew what the crew had on hand to deal with boarders. What do you think we're up against? One of the lackeys asked another. Well, isn't it a Cerberus ship? That human supremacist group? Probably just going to be a bunch of humans then. No shit, I meant how many of the crew will actually know what they're doing, how would I know? Gottis tuned out the idiots and focused on the airlock where an engineer was busy breaking the access code. Pretty soon they would open the door and likely need to deal with a couple of the crew when they tried to hold them off. I think I got it. The engineer called out and retreated from the airlock back to where the rest of the groups were waiting. Thirty seconds and the door. He stopped talking when there was a hiss of air as the airlock to the frigate opened up and a tall figure walked out. Gotti's pegged it as either human or a sari based on first glance and the number of digits on the newcomer's hands, but he couldn't say for certain given the rest of their body was covered in dark black and red robes. There were hints of bronze-colored armor under all the black and gauntlets on her arms, but the biggest thing hiding her species was the gray and red helmet under her hood with a single black slit acting as a visor. Think she's here to surrender? One of the brain-dead humans that had joined on recently asked. Gottis rolled his eyes, a human expression he was quite fond of. Of course the female was here to surrender, or at least negotiate for their release leading up the crew's surrender. Clearly someone on the ship had a pair of brain cells to rub together and didn't want to die. Gottis did wonder what the two metal cylinders in her hands were though. The female walked calmly forward as if completely comfortable with over a dozen guns pointing in her direction. She had just cleared the connection hatch when the sergeant felt she had come close enough. Hold it. Are you here to negotiate a surrender? The female stopped walking and tilted her helmet. A surrender? Very well, I accept. 
For some reason the humans started laughing at that. The sergeant didn't like it though. He always couldn't stand someone mocking him and took anything he was too feeble-minded to understand as an insult. Although Gottis did lower his opinion of the female a bit. It was one thing to show a bit of courage in the face of defeat. It was another to not understand when you had been defeated and should surrender. I want all of your crew to disarm and present themselves on this deck. Do it quickly and I won't have a few of them shot as a demonstration. The sergeant growled. No. Now leave or die. There was a brief lurch in Gotti's brain as he realized that not only was this human, and she had to be human since no Asari could be this stupid, not realized she had angered the one leading fifteen Blue Sun's mercenaries but was actually bold enough to demand they all give up even though she didn't have a single visible gun on her. I, you, how dare, the sergeant was practically vibrating with rage at the dismissal and Gotti's felt a small amount of pity for the crew of the ship in front of them. A few would probably be executed as examples because of this. Oh well. That's what they get for choosing this woman to negotiate. Shoot her. Four guards opened fire. Gotti's didn't care what kind of shields the human had. Four rifles with no cover was a death sentence to all but the oldest Asari commandos. Which was why he was stunned when the cylinders ignited into two blue and red beams of light and the dark figure was briefly hidden behind a wall of light. Not a single one of the Blue Suns knew how to react to that. A Krogan might have managed to survive something like that if they had been in a blood rage, but not just shrug off that much firepower without a scratch. Death it is then. There was a tiny movement in front of the human. The almost non-existent amount of dust on the floor was blown towards them all in a way that reminded Gottis of a biotic push, but there was no corona of energy showing the dark matter manipulation. That didn't stop the invisible surge of force from hitting him in the face along with the other guards and throwing them all backwards. Gottis frantically scrambled back to his feet. He knew it was a bad idea to let the woman out. They should have rushed the airlock as soon as it opened. Damned sergeant hesitating like some cocky asshole, this is exactly why Gottis should be in charge. He didn't look back as the area erupted in the sounds of screams and gunfire. He needed to get to cover. The others should be able to distract the female that long at least. Gotti slid behind a barricade and looked back into a scene out of a nightmare. The female had resumed her leisurely pace forward while the two devices in her spun arcs of light, disintegrating any projectile that came close to hitting her. Some of the guards had frozen up and could only stand there and fire helplessly into the approaching armored figure. Then, when the female was close enough, they would be effortlessly sliced to pieces. The ones outside of her reach were dragged closer by unseen hands. Slowly at first. Just to give them an illusion of escape. Gottis knew the demon in front of them was playing with them, when a rocket-wielding guard managed to line up a shot and it was intercepted by the body of another guard throwing himself in front of the missile. Their body was torn to pieces by the explosion and the shooter was the next one dragged into the demon's glowing claws. He had never really understood the distrust most Turians held for the cabals. Other species seemed to control their biotics easily enough, so why did only his people watch them so carefully? It was because they knew. They knew that there were demons like this. The screams fell silent and Gottis realized it was because everyone else was dead. The black and red demon turned towards him and Gottis knew he was going to die. The sights on his rifle wavered as the she-devil walked closer but he couldn't bring himself to pull the trigger. He needed to figure out how to escape. People needed to know that this thing was here before it could find more of its kind. So all but one decided to fight, huh? The unnatural flat tones of the non-Turian cut through Gotti's growing panic. Noticing the demon had closed the distance much quicker than he was expecting, he threw himself backwards to try and escape the incoming claw and lost his rifle in the process. There was no blinding pain like he half expected, so he looked up from his spot on the ground and found the demon looking impassively at him with its single terrible eye. He tried to make a sound, but nothing would come out but some strangled squeaking. Was this the only team attacking the Normandy? The demon asked, 
But Gotti still couldn't speak. Is Commander Shepard still free? Where is the prisoner Jack? The demon kept questioning him but Gotti's couldn't, no wouldn't, speak to it. Spirits preserve him, he wouldn't give it what it wanted. You are going to make me do this the hard way aren't you? He continued to say nothing as the demon raised an armored limb and placed it on his head. There was a pressure as the demon tried to corrupt him to be its servant but the spirits protected him. It was more painful than anything he experienced and he wailed in his mind as the demon struggled to subjugate him, until the pressure just suddenly cut off. His thoughts were his own and the demon failed. It drew back, defeated, and began to retreat leaving Gottis behind as it fled. He noticed his vindicator lying nearby and quickly retrieved it and aimed at the demon's unguarded back. He was the one chosen by the spirits to clean the galaxy of these demons. And he would start. Snap hiss. With this one. Gottis looked down, confused at the sudden burning pain in his chest and saw the demon's claw glowing a hellfire red in the middle of it. He suddenly felt really tired and realized the demon must have somehow drained his strength with its weapon. A cowardly trick he should have expected. He wouldn't, fall for it, next, time. Oh! Revan watched in mild annoyance as the mercenary slumped over, dead. She had been nice enough to only kill the ones that attacked her and was willing to leave them alone if they ran. But this stupid Turian somehow decided it was a good idea to try and shoot her in the back after she let him go. In a way, she was reluctantly impressed he had even worked up the nerve to attempt such a thing. He had recovered from her first force burst quickly enough that he had managed to find a cover position and aim at her near the start of the fight but hadn't fired a single shot. She could even feel that he was nearly paralyzed by fear as well, so much so that she needed to pull the answers to her questions directly from his mind. Maybe she damaged something in the attempt? Those techniques were dangerous to use that quickly without a thorough understanding of the target's biology. Revan decided she might need to hasten her studies into the races in this galaxy if she was going to use the force for interrogation without causing unneeded pain. At least she managed to learn the Turian language as well though. That would be useful. Anyways, the attacking group was neutralized so her task was complete. Revan activated her calm link and called Joker. This is Revan, all hostiles outside the ship have been taken care of for now. I'm going to go pick up the commander now before something else happens. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm good with that. I'll just have the rest of the crew start polishing your throne for when you get back. Good luck Supreme Dark Overlady, have fun. Revan's lips twitched upward at the irreverent comment. Joker was surprisingly good at hiding behind sarcastic comments, but she appreciated that he made the effort to act like he wasn't terrified of her. You do that, Joker. If I approve, I'll let you sit at my feet as a reward. I'm sure we can find something fitting for the occasion somewhere. Did, did you just make a joke? Joker sputtered incredulously. That was a joke right? Dot 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 Revan? Revan said nothing, but she was smiling as she closed the connection and spread her senses outward. The prison ship was a maelstrom of fear and anger. Tiny specks in the force scurried around either fighting each other or searching for a way off the ship. Revan shifted her attention through all of them, looking for the signatures she had come to associate with the commander and her companions. It helped that she was able to reduce the range of her search to somewhere close to the Normandy since this was supposed to be a pickup before the chaos. The human spectre couldn't have made it too far from them already. A moment passed and Revan started walking deeper into the prison ship. Her earlier smile had vanished when she picked up on the presence the commander had been getting closer to. It was a star of rage and hurt and hate that Revan had mostly seen in Sith acolytes. Not something she was entirely surprised to sense on a prison ship in the middle of space but the intensity was abnormal. Revan had a feeling that this was the person Shepard had been attempting to retrieve. She quickened her pace a bit. She didn't want to get there too late after all. Oh. 
Shepard had gotten a brief look at Jack when they had set her free but she had been a bit more concerned about the army of Blue Suns potentially around the corner to get more than first impressions. So when her squad finally managed to catch up to the rampaging biotic the first thing Shepard wondered was how the hell she wasn't rubbing herself raw using a strap of what looked like leather as a bra. The second was what had the near topless woman in such a frothing rage that she didn't notice the blue sun's murk charging at her until the last second. Shepard swiftly pulled her car fine axe and fired off a shot, dropping the murk and getting Jack's attention. Not wanting to kick off another fight, Shepard raised her hands placatingly and returned her pistol to its mag harness. What the hell do you want? Jack snapped. She was tensed and looking for the slightest signs of hostility. Shepard realized if she softballed this then Jack would try to walk all over her. Besides saving your ass? Jack started pacing, reminding Shepard of a cornered animal more than anything. He was already dead. He just didn't know it. She snapped. Now answer me, what the hell do you want? Okay, maybe that was a little too confrontational. Perhaps dialing it back a bit? Look, you're in a bad situation, I'm going to get you out of here. Shit, you sound like a pussy. Shepard didn't show any reaction to the insult. Despite the words, Jack had slowed her pacing a bit. I'm not going anywhere with you. You're Cerberus. Shepard could already tell Jack was wavering a bit despite that last statement. She didn't miss the confused glances at Miranda and Garrus. The commander could understand the confusion. Cerberus didn't work with aliens if they had the choice most of the time. For a Turian to be in their group meant there was more going on that Jack wouldn't be able to figure out at a glance, and that made her cautious. Why would me being Cerberus be an issue? Shepard asked. They've been on my ass for years. Jack scoffed. Any time I get free, they slap a huge bounty on me. That's why that dumbass Kural thought he struck gold when he caught me. A sneer crossed her face. It isn't working out too well for him. She's destroyed Cerberus property and killed quite a few Cerberus personnel. Hence the bounty. Miranda clarified, but the other two women seemed to ignore her besides Jack narrowing her eyes and glaring at the Cerberus operative. Shepard briefly thought about the trail of destruction Jack left in her wake, the dead prisoners and mercs, and Kural's body lying on the ground somewhere behind them with half his face torn off from getting shot by Garrus's sniper rifle. No, I guess it isn't. She agreed, deciding to ignore Miranda's comment about the reasons for the bounty. She honestly didn't care about it. I'm here to ask for your help though. I'm not your enemy. Good thing too. Being our enemy seems to be bad for people's health. Garrus helpfully added, but it got Jack to snort in amusement so Shepard let it slide. Bullshit. You show up in a Cerberus frigate to take me away somewhere. How stupid do you think I am? Shepard was half convinced Jack was simply arguing to argue at this point, and while she normally wouldn't care that much the purgatory was in the process of tearing itself apart. Will, Shepard said lightly. We are currently on a ship going down in flames. I've got a ticket out and I'm offering you a ride. Her voice hardened. And you're arguing. So you tell me. Jack bristled angrily but Shepard knew she had her. Unless Jack couldn't see even the most blatant writing on the wall the human spectre was her best bet out. Fine, you said you wanted my help. Jack snarled. Make it worth my while. Shepard smiled internally. Game, set, match. All right, what do you want? Jack glared off to her right where past several windows the Normandy could be seen docked. Your ship, I bet it's got a lot of Cerberus databases. Jack looked back at Shepard and continued after the Spectre nodded in confirmation. I want access to them. See what Cerberus has on me. You give me that and I'll join your little team, or whatever. Shepard raised an eyebrow. That's all you want? Jack nodded. Fine then I'll give you full access. Shepard, you're not authorized to do that. Miranda gasped, quickly rising to the defense of her organization. Ooh, and it upsets the cheerleader. Even better. 
Jack sneered and turned back to Shepard. You better be straight up with me. Before the commander could say anything, another voice called out nearby causing all of them to jump. I wouldn't worry about that. The commander is quite good at keeping promises. Revan casually walked out from the shadows like she didn't care she almost gave everyone a heart attack. Jack spun immediately, a glow of biotic energy pouring off of her, and launched herself at the new arrival. Shepard raised a hand and took a step forward hoping to stop the biotic before anything happened but she was too late. Jack collided with Revan and a shockwave nearly blew the rest of them off their feet. Shepard recovered quickly and rushed into damage control. Wait Jack. She's with us. But then she stopped as she took in the sight in front of her. Jack, the human biotic so powerful that she was able to blitz through Emir mechs and ship walls practically unarmed, was being held in place by the Sith Lord. With one hand. Sure Revan at least seemed to be straining a little and needed to take a half step backwards under Jack's assault, but for all Jack's raw power Revan clearly wasn't taking her seriously. Your raw might is impressive, Revan commented, only the tiniest bit of strain audible between the sound of Jack's growling and the slight distortion from her helmet. But you're lacking control. She paused and there was a pulse that sent Jack skidding backwards. You'll need to work on that, who the fuck are you? Jack angrily demanded, the corona of biotic energy flaring higher. Hold it. Shepard interrupted before the two could clash again. Jack, that's Revan. She's part of the crew. And Revan, what are you doing out here? I thought you wanted to stay on the ship. The guards tried to capture the Normandy while you were chasing this one, Revan tilted her head at Jack. After I took care of them I thought you might need help, but by the time I arrived you had talked her down. It was well done. I'll show you well done. Jack growled. Shepard held her breath as the two locked gazes before Revan simply turned her visor to Shepard and ignored Jack. We should leave soon. The purgatory is starting to shake itself apart. It won't be long before a reactor explodes at this rate. Not wanting to let another fight break out, Shepard nodded. All right, let's move out. The five of them quickly headed for the docking area with Jack muttering a string of curses at Revan's back the whole time but when they passed by the remains of the Blue Sun's boarding party she went quiet. Probably wondering how the hell Revan killed them based on the wounds. Still, when the last of them stepped through the airlock and Joker pulled them away, Shepard felt a weight fall off her shoulders. Mission complete and everyone made it home. She couldn't ask for anything more. Okay. Jack, follow me and Miranda to the conference room and we'll get you settled. Garrus, Revan, you're free for now. We'll do a debrief of everything that happened later. Dismissed.